Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar by Product School, which is all about problems that PMs face as problem solvers. My name is Kaushal Jain and I'm a product manager at Microsoft and I'll be taking you through this journey today. All right, so let's begin with uh, a little bit about myself. I have over six years of product and engineering experience um, and I started off with, uh, with engineering degree uh, from IIT Bombay, both bachelor's and master's, after which I moved to Japan to work for Sony and design their smartphone cameras. After Sony, I took a big shift and moved to the healthcare space, where I was working on building health tech products with the Clinton Health Access Initiative. Post that, I completed my MBA from Harvard Business School, after which I've been at Microsoft. At Microsoft, I've worked on the cloud AI and networking space, and more recently with ads engineering team to build great products. Right, so let's, let's talk a little bit about what we are going to be talking about today. I'll start with a quick context and uh, walk through three key challenges that PMs face. We will walk through different examples or case studies across industries to focus on these challenges and then steps you can take to overcome them. Right, so it all begins with this. You are a PM and you are asked to solve a problem. Now that problem can be anything and at any stage of the product life cycle. Let me kind of start with introducing three different examples in different industries that I have been a part of as a product manager and walk through them throughout this discussion as case studies. So the first one is from, from my stint uh, in the healthcare space. So imagine you are a product manager and you've been tasked with this. So make up public health workers efficient through technology. The second word is about the cloud security space, which is again a very fast and rapid growing industry in the last few years. And so this is more of a B2B problem. Here, imagine you're a PM for networking security services in the cloud and you have been tasked with increasing the adoption of cloud security services amongst the customers. And then the third one is from the advertising stint that I'm currently a part of. So this is more of a B2C problem. Uh, and so, so imagine you're, you're an ads product PM and the goal is to improve user engagement on shopping experiences. So as you can see, these are very broad problem statements across very different industries. I am hoping that at least one of these will fit what you are doing and will help you in your careers. Right, so the first thought that comes to my mind often is, all right, so what's the problem? And I get confused, I think too much, I think through like the million possibilities that could potentially be there, to understand the problem and to uncover it. So talking about problems, let's start with the first challenge or first problem, which is all about unpacking options. This is also what I call the cold start problem. Almost always, the problem statement that you are given as a product manager is ambiguous, it is unclear, and it's really hard to understand where to start and kind of how to explore the possible options. Now there are three ways to kind of deal with this and each of these methods rely on getting more information from multiple sources. Right? So the first one is, is about research and reading. So whenever I'm given a problem statement, the first thing that I would do is really understand what the industry landscape looks like, understand who are the competitors, what have they been doing, uh, and also look out for case studies which are kind of similar to the problem statement that I am dealing with and have been tried on either successfully or not so successfully in sister teams, organizations, or outside in the industry. It is also important to look at what the company's strengths are 
and what historically has been the capabilities of your team. For customer feedback, which is the second uh, key bucket here, I would say it is a very, very critical one and any information that you can get about the customers or the users, just take it on. The best way to possibly do that if you have access to customers is through direct interviews. If you already have a very rich data repository sitting uh, in your team, or you understand what are the key metrics, how, how do trends look like for the set of customers you are going to be working with, understand and analyze those, that will give you a lot of insights as well. A third way to kind of think about the customer feedback is through support tickets or any formal feedback mechanism uh, if that has been set up in place for the customers that you are dealing with. If you cannot access customers directly, having conversation with the sales and account teams can also provide you valuable information that can be used to understand what are the potential options and how can you solve for those customers. User research can also be a valuable tool, especially when you are building a new interface uh, for customers. Finally, a PM's job involves a lot of talking, a lot of discussion, and a lot of meetings. And you work with a lot of stakeholders too. Each of them will have certain opinions. It is always helpful to talk to fellow PMs or PMs from sister teams or engineers uh, who have been working with these PMs or engineers from the neighboring teams to get their opinion on how they think about this problem. For example, if you are a new product manager in a particular team, there will be more experienced people from which uh, uh, who will have much more valuable information to share. Marketing, finance, and other stakeholders can also be valuable in really understanding uh, the problem space in certain situations. Now, after doing all this, here are two things that we're looking at from all this research and customer feedback and talking to a lot of stakeholders. The first one is having a clearly defined problem statement. And the second is having a list of several potential options that you could go figure out to solve the problem. Ideally, these options should be logically bucketed into, uh, into, into categories that, that kind of make sense. So for example, they could the, some of the ideas for working for a core tech product could be categorized as you know back end changes, front end changes, or infrastructure changes, or something that you're kind of trying to solve for could be bucketed into new new features or building new features, or just incremental changes, or just you know marketing and sales driven uh, change or problem solving. And getting to this is not easy, right? And it requires multiple iterations, practice and doing it multiple times to kind of get it right. What you focus on out of these three, if you have limited time, which almost always is the case, also depends on the context and will come through practice. All right, so let's connect what we learned in the previous slide to the three case examples that we started with. So the first one, about healthcare efficiency. What I did to begin with was conducted a survey and a lot of interviews with the healthcare workers to really understand the situation on ground. And what this told me or what this gave me was the fact that the data that was available to the decision makers or the government officials was highly unreliable and it was pretty dated. So there was a lot of delay in the data collection and data being shared with the government workers. Moreover, there were a lot of data holes uh, when it actually reached the government officials and that created program inefficiency. I also studied what was done in similar situations in different countries. So countries different from the one that I was working with by some of the other teammates in those countries who are working for the same organization. And so a bunch of options came 
to mind uh, through these discussions and research and understanding uh, all the data we had. So they were around building dashboards or Excel tools or maps or IT tools to be able to give the healthcare workers real-time data and plug the data holes with publicly available information uh, as soon as possible. For the cloud security space, or the case that we're talking about, the discussion with the PMs of, or the owners of these individual uh, networking security services were super helpful. That gave me a lot of context about the key challenges, key areas that they were focusing on. What also helped here was how was the industry shaping up? How are the security services, the cloud security services in this industry shaping up and what are competitors doing in this space? The sales and commerce teams also provided valuable insights about how a customer looks at a bunch of these security services and what are the things that they would ideally expect. So some of the ideas that came through these discussions about uh, solving this problem of increasing adoption were around building a mega security service or kind of doing a deep engineering integrations amongst these services versus a pure sales and marketing play. For the advertising case, we had a lot of data and uh, about users because it all relies on experiments. It's heavily experiment driven culture in the advertising space because the number of consumers or the users you have are way too many to be doing direct interviews. And that's typically the case for any B2C product. So understanding those metrics and trends did help. And the UX and the PM discussions uh, with, the, with the teams who worked on similar ad products did help. Everybody was super excited. And I really understood that the core challenges were around kind of aligning with the fact that we cannot lose a lot of revenue, but we still are motivated to improve the user experience. So there were a lot of incremental ideas in terms of, hey, how can we introduce this free offers here or in this position and make the user happy because there was a, a dissatisfaction from the user or ticket filed in this case and so on. So those were the ideas that kind of came in there. So here's where we landed. And hopefully you can see how I brought more clarity to the problem statement based on the research, the discussions, the customer insights, and all the information that, that I gathered uh, as discussed earlier. So in case of healthcare efficiency, the focus became more on providing data visualizations and how do we improve the efficiency through those visualizations. In cloud security, the focus became product integration led growth and only for existing customers that we had, not net new customers. Whereas in advertising, the focus became how can we show more relevant and free offers to the customers or to the users without hurting total revenue. All right, so hopefully with the first exercise of the first challenge that we talked about, you have a clearly articulated problem statement and you hopefully have a list of ideas that are logically bucketed uh, that you could potentially explore and solve the problem at hand. The next challenge that usually comes with this is how do I select the best idea with a solid rationale? And this challenge that I'm talking about is about prioritizing and then like making sure that you yourself prioritize it and also navigate the chaos around the organization. So I have a three pronged approach for prioritizing the idea. And usually it is exhaustive in whatever situation you are in. Although it might need to be a little bit tuned depending on the context and uh, situation you are in. So for example, you might want to give more weightage to one versus other, but usually these three uh, buckets will cover everything and will cover a broad array, array of problems that you deal with. So the first bucket is about team alignment or the org alignment. The second bucket is about feasibility of implementing the idea. And the third bucket 
is about the value for the customer. So when we talk about the team alignment, I think some of the key points to consider here are whatever idea you're proposing or whatever option you are considering, how does that align with the team OKRs or objectives and key results? And what is the potential to move the KPIs or key performance indicators for your team? How much can they be moved with your idea? I think that strategic alignment with your idea is super critical. And, and then the other thing to think about is how easy is it going to be to internally coordinate and socialize this idea? The easier it is, the, the higher priority your idea should get. Talking about feasibility here, I think the points to consider here are how complex is the idea to implement, how much time is it going to take, how much money is it going to cost the team and the organization, and then are there any other you know, non-quantifiable challenges such as, you know, legal issues, admin, regulatory approvals that you might need to kind of go through uh, to really, you know, get this idea being approved. So I would say that, you know, the easier it is, the more feasible it is, uh, give it a higher priority. And then the third bucket is about value for customer. And this is super critical. Simply put, like what is the value that a customer can potentially get that can be quantifiable, you know, for the customer? Uh, that is super important. Moreover, not just the quantifiable value, but are there other qualitative things or indirect things that a customer is getting, which may benefit you or the org in future and the customer as well? Right. So that also should be a consideration here. And then if you are proposing an idea or an option or solving a problem for the customer, what are the available alternatives and how does this idea fare with the available alternatives for the customer? So that is all about value for customer. And what I would suggest is to have a simple scorecard that stack ranks your ideas or have a list of ideas in the order of priority. Uh, an easy way to kind of do that is just have a score of one, two, three for each of these three buckets and have three columns here. Uh, that should kind of give you a good rudimentary way of prioritizing uh, things. Now, once you have an idea prioritized for you, the other challenge is to convince your sponsor or your boss or your immediate team to be excited about the idea. Now, note that your team might be working on a lot of other things there might it might be chaotic depending on the organization or the team that you're part of so how do you navigate that and make sure that your idea is not only a priority for yourself but also for your team and the best way to kind of do that is whatever you are thinking whatever you have thought through uh, through this framework put that in writing through convincing pitch be it a presentation format be it a you know, document or PRD format, whatever works in your organization, go for it. But as long as it's on paper, it is going to take you a longer distance. The other two things that I would point out here, like I said, because it is super chaotic or it can get chaotic, is to stay calm and stay focused, laser focused on the idea that you have chosen as a priority for the right reasons. You might want to talk in more detail with some people. You might want to zoom out uh, with other people. So you got to be a little bit flexible when you're talking with people and make this a team priority. Right. So like we did with the first challenge and walking through the three case uh, scenarios, let's do it with uh, this challenge as well and bring those three scenarios back. So the first one, uh, the healthcare efficiency one, what I landed was to create a detailed heat map for disease prevalence. And what this would basically do is, you know, get all this data through publicly available sources or satellite sources and combine that or conflate that with the publicly available, uh, the public health information uh, that's available on ground, which might be incomplete or so. But I think that conflation would kind of build a richer data set and help uh, the healthcare workers. And what we indexed on from the framework that I talked about in the previous slide was on the value that this, this potential solution could give 
to the healthcare workers as well as you know how many lives it could save what are the dollars that could be saved by the government if they were able to kind of efficient efficiently implement uh, efficiently take actions and mobilize resources and the other piece that we thought about was on feasibility there was a partnership involved with an external organization uh, who was kind of interested in getting that data and there was a lot of bureaucracy also when you deal with government but we thought it would be manageable in the cloud security space, what we ended up finalizing was to go with a product-led growth approach, which would combine a little bit of engineering aspects and marketing nudges given to the customers who are using either of the services. So the two aspects we kind of over-indexed on uh, from the framework that I talked about uh, in the previous slide were around feasibility because this would be relatively easy to implement versus building a completely new service for the customers. And thinking about the internal alignment, what we thought was we will definitely need the buy-in from all the stakeholders uh, for these particular services that we were targeting. And that might cause a little bit of friction if, if we were asking a lot of work from them. So that way this seemed like a good compromise uh, uh, situation while delivering the impact. And then for advertising, the approach which we landed here was, you know, experimentation, you know, just do a bunch of experiments and iterate and kind of improve. Here, what we balanced was the internal goals of revenue for the organization with the value to the customer, which is, okay, how relevant are the ads? How useful uh, are the ads to me? And so on. So the, the whole idea was, you know, try out one thing, incrementally improve it, rinse and repeat and, and keep it, uh, keep going until you kind of hit satisfactory metrics. All right, so let's talk about the third challenge here. So now ideally you would have your idea kind of prioritized, your team convinced, and now it's all about execution. Your team goes, go and you know, do it for us. Usually execution is filled with a lot of hurdles. Almost always I've faced multiple issues when I can go out and execute. Because most of the things, or most of the problems that you're dealing with as a product manager will involve dependency on a lot of other teams which you do not have a direct authority on. So some of the issues when you're kind of talking or engaging with other teams are gonna be around conflicting goals. Their goals might be different than what your goals are. There might be politics around. There, there's probably gonna be accountability issues like they would question why would they do it for you uh, and so on. Uh, or there might be genuine time constraints. There might be bandwidth issues because there's so much backlog with them. Why and how should they prioritize what you are asking them to do? And so the way to kind of deal with those uh, issues and really think about how can you influence these stakeholders without having a formal authority over them is to really think that they are people first and foremost, right? You're dealing with humans here and, uh, and sort of kind of take take the approach of you know, incorporating these four tenets or values when you're dealing with the stakeholders. So the first one really is about empathy. And what that means is, can you step into the shoes of the stakeholders? Can you live, look, and see the world from their perspective? Only then you would be able to understand what they go through and really adapt what you want to ask for from them, right? So, and, and that kind of brings me to, uh, to sort of the adaptability point here is that when you kind of really understand or see the world from their angle or their perspective, you can hopefully understand their incentives, what, what, are the, what is the environment they operate in, and then align what your goals are with what their goals potentially are. The other piece uh, about expertise here is, is all the research and analysis that you've done on the problem statement, hopefully 
has made you an expert in at least dealing and solving or advocating for this particular solution. So if you have a clear and convincing story about your own goals and your own idea, uh, and if you're perceived as an expert by the stakeholder or the party that you're talking to, that will help in building a trust or a meaningful relationship with the stakeholder. And then the chances of them agreeing to what you say uh, become much, much higher, right? So when it comes to building trust, you've got to stay authentic. You have to be consistent and remember it's, it's about building meaningful relationships. I also want to point out the three modes of influence that were introduced by Aristotle. And uh, so the modes are sort of logos, pathos, and ethos. There's three ways in which people are generally influenced or persuaded. So logos is, is reason and logic. You kind of try and convince people by giving them a rational, a logically justifiable argument and say that, hey, here's the reason we should be doing this. Pathos is, is about emotion. And this is where like the empathy kind of really comes into play. And hopefully you can understand what is their, what are their circumstances, unique uh, uh, circumstances that they kind of live and work in. And if you can play on some of the emotions, that might help them get convinced as well. And the third one is ethos, which is really about finding a common purpose or common ground and, and making them realize that this is for a greater good, which is just beyond their individual sphere. Okay, so let's apply what we learned in the previous slide to the three case study examples that we have been talking throughout this webinar. Now, how do we think about those? So let's begin with the healthcare efficiency piece. The two modes of influence that I used here were pathos and ethos. So uh, like I mentioned, the external partners I was working with uh, who owned the models to kind of create those heat maps and they were looking for data. So it kind of was a win-win situation and uh, it kind of played on their pathos and ethos. The other piece that I kind of worked, uh, as I mentioned, I was working with healthcare workers and really understanding how their life looks like. Uh, so convincing them to use this solution was really playing on uh, pathos and really kind of empathizing with uh, what their day-to-day -day looks like and how can that get better. For the cloud security service uh, services, I think the key point or the key mode here was uh, was around ethos, right? We are collectively improving uh, the adoption for all the security services. So it's beyond or above a single individual PM or owner as such. So convincing them about that and then also making them realize that, hey, this is for a greater good. The customers will get stickier to our platform and eventually get in more revenue, which will help you, right? So they're really thinking about the greater good uh, and something that just goes beyond their individual service was critical. And the same argument kind of worked with sales, marketing, and finance teams because this was about improving the overall portfolio rather than a particular service, which they care about. Similarly, so for in the advertising team, uh, like I said, this is a lot of experiments and numbers uh, and driven uh, kind of uh, B2C nature of, of, of this problem statement. So what I relied on was logos and ethos. We're like, okay, we'll do these experiments. We'll look at the numbers. If they get good, it, it's great. Otherwise, we keep iterating and keep improving. Everybody bought that logic and that kind of worked. The other piece was kind of a little bit of ethos around that, hey, this will be greater good because you know your support tickets are gonna go down, users are gonna be happy, and uh, our revenue hopefully is not gonna suffer if we do the right experiments and right iterations. There was a little bit of ethos there as well. So just wanna kind of uh, mention here that, like I said, that there might be different modes of influence depending on the situation that you are part of and the type of stakeholders that you're dealing with. Okay, so here we are uh, at the summary slide and uh, just want to share some final thoughts here. As a product manager, you're often, like I said, given very broad set of problems, often, in, often about industries that you may not have worked in the past. They're completely new. Uh, they might be completely new to you or you might have worked in that industry, but the nature of the problem might be completely new to you, 
right? Uh, so we talked about the first challenge, which was about cold start problem and how do you really unpack your options? And the two key things there are to come up with a really concrete and clearly defined problem statement and do all the research that you possibly can at this stage to understand the possible universe of options that are there and hopefully kind of list them uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a logically understandable manner. The second challenge or the problem that we talked about was about prioritizing and navigating the organization chaos. A key part of being a product manager is to drive clarity in whatever you do, no matter what stage you are and, and wherever you are. And if you can do that through prioritization and making sure things are clear for you as a PM and for your team, even more importantly for your team, that will set the path for a smooth execution and a greater impact. Uh, and it will avoid all the chaos that usually is uh, with so many teams and so many stakeholders in place. And then finally, we talked about uh, the execution mode and the issues that come uh, with that around influencing without authority. You're dependent on so many people uh, to kind of do the work for you but then you don't really have a direct authority on them. Like I said, it is all about people. It is all about building the right relationships and trust. It is all about being the authentic you, right? So don't forget the logos, ethos, and pathos that I talked about and the examples that we went through. Right, so that brings me to the end of the presentation and hopefully uh, this was uh, helpful uh, uh, to you, not only in terms of the frameworks of thinking about the problems, but also implementing them in diverse set of situations which we talked about, B2B, B2C, or working in public sector with the government kind of a scenario. Uh, I do want to kind of leave you with a couple of thoughts. Here's my LinkedIn to kind of would love to connect with you and, and know more about you. and. Uh, I do want to thank uh, uh, Shema Patak, who is also a product manager at Microsoft, in, uh, uh, for her help in building some of these slides. Thank you, and have a nice day.